I won the US Open, did the Netflix, and things have changed like drastically. So on that last shot, what was that like? Yeah, I mean, on, on the last shot, where we were aiming was like well away from where the ball actually ended up. And I just remember looking up and it was like going towards the flag and I was just like, oh my God, this is like, thank God, like I've had such a good shot there. You know, I remember being on the green and saying to like my my dad, like, you know, we, we did it. A lot of people <laughs> believe that that moment of achievement, suddenly the whole world makes sense. Yeah, and it think it lasts happy. forever, yeah, yeah. And it doesn't. And it, yeah, it, it, it doesn't. People laugh at the, all the numbers and stats that I, that I take down. You know, it's Do they? it's like it, not in a not in like a nasty way, but it's like a bit of a, a running joke. Oh, Fitzy's probably got a spreadsheet out. I probably wouldn't dream of asking Tiger like any mental advice because I'd be scared to death to ask him for one. But also, <laughs> I don't think he'd tell me. And I, I think... always think that. I always wonder, like, are you getting the truth? What is it that you really want? Then what's the thing? It's the beating everyone. You know, it, it is the it's the winning. It, it is the winning. It doesn't matter how good you are mentally if you if you can't hit the ball straight. You know, it doesn't matter. Practicing with intensity, it's like every shot matters. Like I'm not worried about playing someone who's you know six four and hits it three forty down the middle. It's like I'll beat them another way. Well, Matt, welcome to High Performance. Thank you. What is high performance to you? High performance to me is competing or you know achieving doing something um a very high level uh with success i've been thinking about that for a while to be honest but that that's what i would say so i'd love to know where the seeds of this kind of competitive mindset were planted if you rewind the clock of 20 25 years like what do you think comes to you from your childhood that maybe set you up for this I think majority of it was my dad, to be honest. He, he just didn't want to lose. And I think growing up with my dad and obviously a younger brother as well, um, once we sort of got to the age that we could both play sport and stuff, um, that was the, you know, that was the, the big thing. I think he, he sort of pulled it out of us really and we, we just always wanted to be him. So what, so what sort of messages was he giving you then, Matt, at that young age? I think... The big thing for me, I guess like when I was sort of 9, 10, 11, I was just sort of getting into the game, you know, playing. Um, he wasn't like coaching me, but he was in terms of technique, but he was kind of coaching me in what club to hit or where to aim and, and little things like that. I think that once I started playing more competitions, it was more, if you want to do this, we'll take you, we'll, you know, we'll ferry you around, we'll do what, you know, what you want to do, but it, it's on you to put in the work, you know. Um, he was never super pushy. You got to go, you know, you need to stay there for two hours and do this. And um, both my parents, it was just like, if you want to do it, like, you know, you, you've got to put the work and work and effort into it. Um, and I think there was, you know, for, for me, there was always that, that I, I did, I did want to do that. And at the same time, I wanted to kind of, I just wanted to win. So what age are we talking about here then? Probably like 15 onwards, I'd say, that where it really sort of started being like, okay, I wanted to get into the England boys, England under 16 set up. And um, all of a sudden you start, you know, my dad's like, well, these are the results you might probably going to need to get selected. And uh, these are the tournaments you played. I mean, my dad's so like well researched in, in amateur golf stuff when we were younger. It was like, we play, you know, you should play this. It's a great golf course or this is a great tournament. And, um, you know, just, of his own interest, he's just gone out out of his way to to sort of find all the information. Really, see, because there's a really interesting dynamic when we look at your background. That so your caddy Billy used that great phrase where he said, "You look like an altar boy," but there's a real grit about you. <laughs> yeah. But also, there's something around you taking comfort in the numbers and the stats. To so because they don't lie, they yeah. tell you where you are. Yeah. And it sounds very much like they were the two elements that your dad was feeding into you, make sure you know where you are, but you've got to have that resolve. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I think for me, it's probably not until, I'd probably say 2019 is where it really took off in terms of the numbers and everything, uh, where I really sort of got a lot deeper into it. What are you now, 29? 29, yeah. So we're going back five years when you said I went. So yeah. what happened then when you were 24, 25? 
What was the awakening at that moment? Yeah, I think 2018, I'd, I'd not really played great. Um, I'd played okay. Um, I brought on my now trainer, Matt Roberts, and um, he used to work in football. And, and when he first came on, he was like, so, you know, what, what do you do for practice? And I was like, well, you know, I'll go to the course, spend a bit of time on the range, spend a bit of time on the putting green, hit some chips, and that's about it, go home. He's like, right, okay. Anyway, got to towards the end of that season and um, he was like, oh, listen, you know, I think you need to change your practice, like how you do it. And and this is, you know, small area of like skill acquisition and challenges and all that sort of stuff. And I was like, okay, fair enough. Like, you know, what are you thinking? So we towards the end of the year, we tried some of these challenges that he thought of and he, no offense, he, he didn't really know much about golf at that time. And um, What sort of things? So like... For me, we did like five distances, say 100, and then every five yards up until like 125. Uh, three balls at each distance, and you've got to try and hit it on on the numbers, basically. So nothing like super crazy, but uh, we have a piece of technology called Trackman, which basically tracks that, so we just do it on the range. And then I noticed that I had a bit of an improvement. It didn't stand out massively, but I've, you know, I felt like that was that was definitely better. But then, sort of to rewind back to 2015, it was the first year I was on tour, um, and I wasn't very well. Uh, one, I'd not played well the start of the season, um, and all of a sudden, I was just like at home, and I was like, oh, I'm just going to write out a plan. And I wrote out this blueprint, basically, of how I envisaged how I would practice, how I would, you know, do my daily drills or exercises. Um, I got a picture on my phone, and and it still makes me laugh, and. Um, literally everything that we talked about in 2018 was just on this piece of paper and like it wasn't until 2019 that I actually did something with it so I brought right. someone else in one of my coaches Steve Robinson who's more of like a performance guy from from my side he's a golf coach as well but he's purely like looks at the stats thinks about drills and challenges that we can do to you know hone in on certain skills that we need um, and that's kind of where it all kicked off 2019 onwards was, was then really. Um, so yeah, I would say that was kind of the awakening to like, all of a sudden, oh, wow, I'm missing a big part of the, the game here. But there's that really interesting phrase, Matt, that good is the enemy of great because you were relatively successful. Yeah. You were yeah, yeah, yeah. where you'd have dreamt of when you were 15. Yeah. And I'm interested in what kind of, lessons you could pass on to our listeners then about how you do have the courage to break things even if it's not particularly broken. Yeah, and I think that's the the hard part for me. Uh, I think I, like I'm obsessed with trying to find, to get better with anything, anything and everything like I'll look into it and um, you know, my coach Mike, he always says that. He's like, it's such a great trait of mine is, but it sometimes it can hinder me as well you know come too obsessed with something or searching a little bit too much and and I think for me it was well it's been great to be able to make these changes and fortunately I feel like they've paid off but I feel that I've been lucky to have the people around me that that have helped me do that in the right way I think it'd be very easy and you look at other players maybe in the past that may have tried to try things drastic changes and I don't know if they've got I you know I can't speak on behalf of them but I don't think they've got maybe the best advice on it um and I just feel the people around me have always given me they've, they've always been honest they've always given me the you know what they think and I, and I trust them I, I absolutely trust them um 110 percent you know with, with anything really and um, I think that's kind of why I've been able to maybe just push push on, really. So can I pick up on that word trust? That if you're going to allow people into your inner circle that are going to challenge you and push you, what is it that they do that means that you will invest your trust in them? Well, if you look at my team, they got me from Yorkshire. <laughs> <laughs> Rule number one. Uh, yeah, but uh, no, no. I, I, the, the thing is... I think within the team, which I've always appreciated and, and, and I think is just invaluable, is everyone's always been honest with me. There's no sugarcoating anything. It's not like, 
you know, it's just straight to the point. tells tells me how it is. tells me if I've I've, I've been, you know, an annoying little shit, or or I've been, you know, working working hard really. And um, I think you know the people that I work with have had experience before I started working with them more and more. So, you know, that's obviously a big factor. Um, but not only are they, they work hard themselves to, to get better as well. And I think that's kind of the, the big thing that I feel everyone that within my team kind of works hard to, to make themselves better, really. So I'm, I'm interested in when you talk about all the different inputs that you get, Matt, what do you think makes you so coachable? I feel like, cause I'm always just trying to, get get better um i think sometimes i'm sure my coaches probably think i'm a pain in the ass to be honest because i'm like asking questions oh what about this and what about that but um i think i've got better at that over time too i think it's very easy in golf to be very reactive um and i still have those days where you come off the course and it's not working out and it's like what about this we need to try this and um, but certainly conversations I've had with Mike when I've finished the round, I've tried to be much sort of calmer, a bit clearer in my thinking and um, tried not to be too reactive, tried to come up with a, a simple plan that we can kind of execute for maybe the next day or if it's the following week. Um, I think that's been a big thing. I think it's just me in the past, I feel like I've come off sometimes um, or even in practice weeks and it's like, I get in a bit of a state. It's like, oh, well, this is wrong and this is wrong and I need to do this and what do you think of this? And it's, you just, you end up just confusing yourself rather than giving, you know, two or three things that you can stick to. Can you give us and, an example of when you've adopted this new mindset then? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think certainly over the last few months, to be honest, um, struggle with driver, uh, always been a strength of mine and I str struggled this year with it. And literally, it was only about four or five weeks ago. It was like the Saturday I played in in Memphis on in the first playoff event, and um, we basically said, "All right, okay, three things that we're going to do um, for the next however many weeks, um, or, or basically just stick to those three things, and and it should improve, and you know, it should improve visually if you video and you swing on camera." should improve feeling wise myself and then obviously the outcome as the statistics tells you that it's improved fortunately it all did um but i think it's more like i i have such high expectations of myself and high expectations of what i want to achieve it's very easy for me to kind of get worked up about that when it's not happening and i look at other players that are playing well week in week out and it's like well I, you know i want to do that um and I'm trying to almost, you know, get there a bit too quick. And that's when I feel like I've got a short fuse sometimes. And that's where I've had to take a step back coming off the golf course and try to have a bit clearer thinking and have a, like a very calm conversation with Mike. And um, and he's fantastic at it because he understands the mind like so well. He's very into his, um, Steve Peters' chimp paradox and, and that sort of stuff. And um that's what another reason for me why why he's very 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 good at his job. So we've spoken a fair bit about the kind of physical things that you might have done or learned or improved. Let's have a conversation then about the mental side of golf. When did you realise that you were going to get involved in a sport where you lose an awful lot more than you win? <laughs> you know, I, my amateur career was really weird. Really, uh, when I was younger, I didn't really play men's golf. I turned pro when I was nineteen. Yeah. Um, so my amateur golf was kind of strange. I was always on the I was always on the outside. I felt like England got, well, it's true, England golf had like a southern bias of selection process. And if you lived in the south, you got much more of a chance of getting picked. And um, so it was always kind of, you know, you, you, I was like fighting for my place and needed good results and um, just knew that I had to have these good results in my mind. But then you turn pro and you get out here and you're like, no one really cares what you did as an amateur. Like it's it's nice, but it doesn't really it doesn't really mean anything. Um, but then, kind of once, like I was sort of eighteen, nineteen, I had some really good results within the US amateur. Now all of a sudden, these professional doors open. It's like, hang on a minute, like this, you're doing this for a living. Like you need to make the cut to make to make money, and you need to, you know, 
get a card to be able to play the whole season next year. That, that there's loads of these things all of a sudden that you enter your mind. And I felt very lucky that actually looking back, I wasn't ever really worried about that. I, I never caught myself like, oh God, I, you know, I need to make this core. I need to make this. Like, and I think I've, I think that was probably from my parents just because I felt like they were would always look after me really, which was probably a bit unfair on them. But um I certainly think growing up that, um, you know, they just instilled that, you know, you got to work hard and, and you'll get there in the end. And I think that's kind of what was, or it still is, like always my, my thought really. So what would you say was the big difference between the world of amateur golf and professional golf then when you first made that transition? I think amateur golf, it's kind of like, you know, you don't have a great result and it's like, well, it's okay there's you know there's next week it doesn't really hinder you that much professional golf you know you miss a couple cuts in a row it's like panic stations almost it's like right well okay i need to do something because i can't do that and get to where i want um am i going to lose my card as you know what how am i going to afford to play the next week and i felt very lucky that you know what i did achieve in my amateur career kind of put me in a good position going into my professional career i was you know, lucky enough to have great sponsors at the time and, and didn't have to worry about, you know, travel costs and entry costs and all that sort of stuff. So um, I think there is just a big shift in mindset and I feel like I got lucky in that I never felt that change. I just felt like it was always just going to happen almost. Right. It's interesting that, isn't it, that, that it didn't derail you at any point and you weren't kind of overwhelmed by the fact that you were a pro suddenly playing alongside like these legends of the game was there any struggles because it's you're making it sound easy like. i know i, I know and, and the, 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 that's the weird thing i think obviously i'm very numbers driven <laughs> but like i look at like my stats effectively and that the the graph is kind of a it's like a shallow incline, which is which is great. Um, there has been drops in, in performance, like the, there's no doubt about that, and that's just always going to happen. But um, I feel like my first year on tour was probably the biggest learning experience because, like, I started off the year and didn't play very well, and it's like, well, now I do need, you know, getting closer to the end of the season, running out of tournaments almost, and and then all of a sudden something happened and I, I couldn't even tell you what it was. I just started having a couple of good results and ended up keeping my card. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, now I'm safe. Then I ended up kicking on some more. And um, I think for me, it was just kind of around 17 and 18, 2017 and 18. I think that was kind of the time where, I, like I say, I, I was playing well, but like I, I'd, I wasn't kicking on as much as I, I wanted to, you know, I was looking at players around me that I knew and um, I, I wasn't performing well enough in, in the US and that was obviously where, where the game was going and um, that's where I felt like something needed to change. So when you talk about this sense of expectation that you had of yourself, how, like, how did you combat the idea that maybe you had just found your limit? You know, like I can imagine mm -hmm. that for some players, they get there and the culmination of being on the tour is enough and complacency then kicks in of as long as I can maintain this. And you seem to be somebody that was constantly striving for the next target, the next challenge. Yeah, I, I had a funny conversation with Mike after, uh, after the US Open. I was like, it was obviously such a high and I've kind of come off it and I'm like, I, I almost feel flat. You know, I felt like, what if I, you know, I almost didn't want to go and practice. I almost didn't want to play the rest of the tournaments for the year. I just kind of wanted to do, enjoy it. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, well, will, you know, will I ever get that that bug back to go and practice hard and work hard? And came back like three months later, <laughs> three months later or something when I wasn't playing as well. But um, I think it's just like always been in my nature that I, I've, I just, feel like I can compete with with the best when when I've when I've played my best I, I can compete with the best and to me it's trying to get more of that out of me more regularly really I know people make a big thing about noting down sort of what do they say every shot he's ever played he's written it in one of the books right 
I'm interested in what that does for you because it feels to me like you've got a load of safety nets. You know, we've spoken about what your parents provide for you and the people around you provide you with this sort of safety net. Um, I know you recently got engaged. There's another one. Then it, it's almost like you're great at putting these things in that just almost give you a bit of protection. Am I reading that right? Yeah, yeah. No, I would say so. I, I think, like I say, I, I'm, I'm obsessed with the numbers because I just feel like if I know where I'm, where I am currently am, or know where I am at all times, okay, well, I know I need to get better than that, or what do I need to do to get better than that? And then it's like, well, how are we going to do that? And I feel like that's a combination of all the team where we think of the ideas to, you know, to, to get better. Um, and that that is why really I, I keep all the the information and the data and look at it just because I feel like that tells me where I am at all times and tells me, okay, well, I've got this, how much to go, or, or I need to change this, I need to do that. So. so can I ask when you first wrote down those numbers? Yeah, two, 2009. I mean, I've kept stats ever since I was on tour. Yeah. Um, so I like on the course, so 2015, um, even in my amateur days before, but I, I don't know where they are, but 2015 to, to today, I've got my stats uh, from just tournament play. Um, but 2019 onwards is when I started recording like my practice challenges and, and stuff like that. So is every shot now like gets... Pr pretty pretty much. much, yeah, yeah, pretty much. A anytime, anytime that I'm doing like a performance sort of challenge really, uh, that's that's what we record. I'm not recording like every shot after I've hit a technical, you know, just a regular range shot. So. And how often do you go back to revisit these? Well, we're kind of in the process at the minute of... Um, trying to pull it all together in one place and be able to compare practice and, and tournament play, seeing if there's any correlation, you know, when I practice well here, does that influence this? Or, or uh, We're trying to do that at the minute, basically. We've got five years of data and as Steve, my coach, says, it's like, that it feels like we're just collecting data for data's sake now, yeah. whereas we need someone to go through it and see what they can find and um, I'll be devastated if there's nothing, but I'm convinced. I'll be com I'm convinced there's at least one thing. There's got to be one what, thing. What do you think it will show? <sighs> Honestly, I've got no idea because I just feel like there's so many variables. Yeah. There's so many variables. I, I mean, the one thing that I, I feel like I came up with the other day was noting down when I had any technical changes in my swing or or anything like that, and then finding the date, seeing where I was at with my game, and then, you know, look a week later, two, three, four weeks, seeing like when that intervention, when it either kicked in, did it improve, did it not improve? Because um, I have kept notes over the last five years of what, what I did in my lessons with, with Mike. Um, so I feel like that's, you know, that's another area that we can look into. I mean, it's interesting. We interviewed Matthew McConaughey, the Oscar winning actor, who has got 30 years worth of data through his diaries. And what he said he does is when things start to go wrong or awry, he goes back to the data and says, when it was going well, what was I doing? What was my sleeping? What was my diet like? Who was I hanging around with? Mm. And that allows him to see where he's, slight, where he's maybe come yeah. off course a little bit. And I'm interested, do you think like there's a killer start that, you know, when I nail that start, everything else tends to follow. I, I do feel like there could be, yeah. Um, I do feel like there could be. I mean, you know, like I say, there's so many variables that go into practice and, and tournament play, but um, everyone has a blueprint of how their game is. So, you know, my strengths are driving and putting. Other guys might be iron play and short game. Um, but I feel like if I'm practicing, I'm taking a guess here. If I practice in, and I'm, my driving's good and my putting's good, probably going to lead to good results on the course in, in those areas. I don't think it's quite as black and white as that, but I definitely think there's something in it. So how much do you play to your strengths and how much do you try to mitigate for your weaknesses then? And, and, then, and again, that's the, that's the balance that we're looking at. You know, we, we have the breakdown of how much time we're spending in each area and and what it is that we need to do to Im improve in each area. Um, I mean, for me this year, my driving normally a strength is what's let me down. I would say the last two, three months, we've, or sorry, probably the last month, 
we spent much more time on on driving. Um, so you'd think other areas might might drop, but me and Michael were saying it's like spinning plates. You know, you spend all this time on one, and one's probably like dropping off. And um, it, it is that's the annoying thing about golf is there's just so many things to keep an eye on. All of this is about you, right? It's about your stats, your numbers, <clears throat> your shots, your preparation. What room have you left for watching other people and asking questions of what others do? I, I really don't like to ask other golfers. I, I really don't. And and people obviously often have said that to me, you know, or, you know, like Billy said, oh, speak to Luke Donald about his short game or speak to um, whoever, whoever it is about that. But, you know, they swing it differently. Their feelings are different. Their technique is different. I don't feel like how it can apply to me. Things like course preparation or diet or ideas on how to play the game. Yes, I, I would get it. But anything that's like probably physical, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to get involved because it's like not my. It's like not my pattern. Um, and and I just don't. I feel really uncomfortable with that stuff because I don't feel like I. I want to get into bad habits from someone else. But you're all playing the same game mentally, right? You're all playing a very different game physically. Yeah. So have you gone to any goal? Like, I don't know, I look at someone, let's take Tiger Woods as yeah. a great example, an elite golfer decade after decade. He must have some mental advice that he can hand to other yeah, golfers. Think, it almost feels a shame not to no, tap into I, that I, or Rory or I, someone. I, I agree, I agree. And, and I, think, um, I think it's funny, me personally, I think when you're actually involved in the game and you see these people, you play alongside them and you get to know them, you, you know, you understand the character, you understand how they are in these moments. I feel like when you're playing in the last group, coming down this, the final stretch and, you know, you see the strengths and you see the weaknesses, in, in my opinion, and just like they see my strengths and weaknesses as well. And, you know, I think everyone would rate themselves as, as better than everyone else. You know, there, that's it, golf's a very selfish individual sport. And I would say that you, we all put ourselves on a pedestal above everyone else when we feel like we're playing our best, mm. I think, anyway, certainly at the top level. And for me, I, I find it hard to kind of, I also find it a bit odd when you're trying to play against these guys and be like, oh, what do you think about this? Do I, for them to share that advice, I think, is, is difficult, you know. Um, I probably wouldn't dream of asking Tiger like any mental advice because be scared to death to ask him for one but also I don't think he'd tell me and I, think, I always think that I always wonder like are you getting the truth well, yeah. almost like they tell you yeah they tell you something, something yeah. that's a bit ni nicer or simpler than actually what they're really what? doing think right. positive yeah. You, yeah you've won one of the most famous golf tournaments in the world why would you be scared to go and speak to Tiger Woods Tiger Woods, isn't it? <laughs> no, no I, I could have a conversation with Tiger, but I just feel like, again, it's the same deal. You know, he's playing again. I mean, he's not playing at the minute, but he's playing against me. Why Why would he reveal that? Like, you know, I, I people ask my advice. I, I'll be honest, I don't tell them the truth. Like, I, well, I tell them the truth, but like, but not the whole a truth. Very dumbed down version. Yeah, very, very dumbed down version. Because I noticed when you spoke about our issues with my driver. So we focused on three areas. You weren't. You didn't tell us what the three areas were. <laughs> no, no, no. That was no. on purpose, right? Well, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, what I found interesting watching some of the documentaries about you, though, Matt, is that some of the big alphas that are on on the American tour that were quite loud and brash and very domineering characters, and you were sort of the opposite of that. You were almost quite quiet, keeping your head down, just getting on with it. And I'm interested in. How do you block out the noise from those dominant characters to make sure you can just focus on your game rather than being distracted? I think it's just, to, again, it's having the, the trust in doing what works well for me. Um, you know, people laugh at the, all the numbers and stats that I, that I take down. You know, it's, do they? it's like, it, not, in a, not in like a nasty way, but it's like, it, that's like, it's yeah, it's like a bit of a, a running joke or... Oh, he's probably got a spreadsheet out which Amongst always, it always makes players. me laugh yeah it always, yeah. It always okay. makes me laugh no not really no no not really um, I, it always it always makes me laugh because like to me it's like well 
I feel like I've got an edge over everyone mm. because I do that. And that's like, that's like my thing. Just like they might think something else that they do is an edge as well. But um, I just have a real belief in the people I work with and the real belief in myself to find the answers to get better doing, you know, whichever way it is. Um, that would be my way of looking at it. Like I'm not worried about playing someone who's, you know, 6'4 and hits it 340 down the middle. It's like I'll beat them another way, you know. So, you know, when you walk into the next hole, and again, I'm often intrigued to take us into that conversation of when you're walking together with them, are you talking to each other? What's a yeah, conversation it's like? like? It's polite chit chat. You Is know, it? Yeah, it's, it's like, oh, what's your schedule coming up? And, oh, are you going anywhere on holiday? It's just like polite chit-chat. No sledging? No sledging. No, no, never. That's like... <laughs> the swing not, looks a bit off today. What's yeah, going on? exactly, <laughs> exactly. Got a few issues have you? There's, not, there's none of that. But I mean, you know, Billy always tells me, Sevi always used to say, shake hands on, on the tee with the guy and it'd be like, play well and couldn't mean it less. You know, it, it's like, it, it's everyone always does it. They always say, oh yeah, play well. Can we, Do we really mean it? I mean... You want to yeah. win, right? Yeah. You want to beat Everyone them. wants to beat each other, yeah. Let's talk then about Billy, because I know it's a special relationship that you both have, and it needs to be really between golfer and caddy. How would you describe your relationship? Uh, I think we've got a, a very good relationship, I think. Um, you know, I respect Billy a hell of a lot, given what he's done in his career, his experience, his knowledge. Um you know, sometimes we don't always see eye to eye and, and I have a different theory on what he has. Um, he's taught me a lot. I think I've taught him a lot. Um, I think the biggest thing is that we just seem to have a lot in common. Like, you know, we're, we're kind of both from working class families, I guess, and just like very down to earth, both love football. And I just think like we just get on really well and just, you know, for the most part, I'd say we just, enjoy our time out there um really and what's the biggest thing he's taught you i wouldn't necessarily say it's taught me i think it's what how we work together i think he's very he's very straight to the point he's very direct it's you know it's it's like there's no i mean there's never um in an r and it's like it's 180 r seven nine that's it you know it's whereas i've had caddies previously where it's like well, it could be this, but maybe that. And what about there? And it's like you you end up like having too many thoughts in your head. Then you're not commit committed to the shot, and then it's probably a poorer shot. Um, I think I've learned a lot from that. Being more, you know, just straight to the point. And and he's very honest in his feedback and in, in what he says to me about my game, how he sees it, my game, um, his, his conversations with the coaches, you know. He's very lucky. Lee Westwood's arguably one of the best drivers of the ball all time. Seve Palestiros, one of the best, you know, arguably short games of all time. And Sergio Garcia is probably one of the best iron players of all time, which is painful for me because he's like, I hit all these other shots and he's like, what is that? You know, because he's seen those guys. Yeah. So it's, it's tough because sometimes he's got those colored glasses on where he's, you know, um, but it's very valuable, his feedback, what he, what he gives. And obviously, as you just mentioned, he's worked with the best, right? So we've discussed the fact that you're a humble guy. Are you humble enough to say to him, what would Sevi have done in this situation? What would he have played here? No. You wouldn't? I, I, again, it goes back to the, you know, like, I know I can't, I know I don't, I don't play the same style of shots like Sevi or I don't have the same technique as Lee or, or Sergio and like, what's going to be again kind of going back to numbers like what's optimal for me yeah, what's yeah. the right thing for me what do I practice you know there's multiple times this year where he said oh I, I see this shot and I'm like well I don't really practice that so I don't feel comfortable doing that I'm going to do it this one instead it's um which again you know he, he totally understands and how do you agree to disagree then when that happens what's your strategy um, I think sometimes sometimes I could be better with that rather than just agreeing to to what he what he says. Um, I think we do have very good conversations if we're unsure and if I'm kind of um, again I'm kind of looking at the number side of it and it's like well if the flag's at the back of the green and there's water pass over the green, you take the club that 
is almost physically impossible that can go that far rather than trying to really hit it close, you know, say three out of 10, you could hit it really close, but the other seven could go in the water. It's like sort of give and take. And I feel like we have those conversations pretty, pretty, pretty openly and, and, and well. And what room do you leave for instinct? I think it's half and half. I know it doesn't sound like it, but I do think it's half and half. I think, you know, hitting the golf shot itself is, yes, you're trying to hit these positions, but like if you're on the golf course thinking, well, okay, I've got to go here and here and here and here, you know, you're never going to hit a good shot. So I think, you know, we t often talk about doing these rehearsals and drills and technique stuff on the range, but then when I go on the golf course, it's like just you just play, you know, you just you're not even you're not thinking about that. You just you just play, and then at the same time, you know, I'm thinking about okay, what's the optimal play here? Where what's the optimal place to hit it here? What about here? Um, so I, I do think it, it it's it is a combination. And you use that lovely phrase before around before I commit to the shot. And I'm interested, what's the process then from the moment you arrive on the tee between taking in all this data and information until the moment that you choose to, I want to commit to this completely? Yeah, we, we talk about, uh, you know, first things like, okay, what club is it off the tee? All right, it's driver. Where's our line? Okay, it's that TV tower. All right, where's the wind? It's off the right. Okay, and then then for me, that once I've got that information from Billy, and obviously a little bit input myself, then it's like, okay, it's over to me. It's like, okay, well, how am I going to get the ball there? So then it's like, okay, I know what I, you know, I know what club it is. I know what what I'm doing now. I've just got to get it there. And then it's kind of like into my routine. And, and then what's that? What there. do you tell us about? So my routine is like two practice swings behind the ball. Look at where you know I'm trying to finish it. Step in there aim my club face, have another look, set up, have another look, and then get and then go. Um, so, again, I've had that same routine, you know, for, for, for years now. Um, and I do think that, I think growing up, I, people are always like, you need a routine, coach, you need a routine. And I just feel like, why does it really matter? But I think in the heat of the moment, having that consistency of, doing the same thing, you know, breathing the same amount of times, whatever it might be, I think that is the, helps the clarification of, you know, what you're going to do. And in those moments, does self-doubt exist? Is there that cheeky little dissenting voice in your head? Yeah, definitely, definitely. If there's, if there's water on the left, it's always like, oh, don't hit it left, you know? Um, but I think when you're playing well, it's kind of less of an issue because you just feel like you know where the ball's going to go. I think when you're not playing so well, it's almost a bit like, well, on the last hole I hit it left, and on the last two holes ago I hit it right, like, where's this one going? You know, I think when you're not playing well, it's kind of, it's obviously much harder, and I think that's kind of the the big issue. Um, I think when you are playing well, it's a little bit, a little bit easier to commit. And so much work has gone into your game, physically and mentally. You've got great people around you. You clearly work incredibly hard to get yourself to this point. But before you won the US Open, there was something that was not quite right. And I've read that Billy stepped in to help. Would you mind sharing that story with us? Yeah, it's it's kind of a mix of the two, really. Um, finished 21, played okay, didn't play great. Felt like my irons were the big letdown. That's where I was missing a big, big part of my game. So we basically changed my technique with my irons, um, me and Mike, and he wanted me to basically be a little bit straighter in my left arm, which did a couple of things to, to help me have more control, basically. Practiced it in January, felt pretty good. Then basically went on a run between January and May of like probably, I don't know, maybe seven top tens out of, 10 events or something. It was just like my best run of golf that I've I've ever played. Like I just knew that I was playing really well. Everything felt really solid. Um, <clears throat> but then I was putting myself in these positions because I was playing so much better. Um, but nothing was really going my way. I wasn't kind of getting in the final groups to contend on Sunday. It was like I was having 
average day Saturday, then maybe a good day Sunday to finish top 10 rather than kind of being in there with a chance to win. So I was getting frustrated with it really. And and I think one week was probably one week too far for Billy because I was complaining, oh, how's that done that? And I can't believe that's a lie. And this never goes right for us. And um, anyway, we I missed the court, d- didn't play very well. And uh, literally, I'm at home like probably the week week after, and my parents are at home as well. And I get a call off Billy, and I'm like, Billy never calls me in a week. This is, I'm like, oh god. Like, so I go upstairs to take it, and he's like, oh, listen, you know, I really didn't enjoy last week. Um, you know, you were moaning a lot, this, and it was negative, and um. You do, you just got to let it go. You, you know you've got to have a better attitude on the golf course, and that's you know that's that's the difference. That's gonna, that's what's holding you back. So I was like, you know, there's again, there's the honesty, and I've got to accept that it's not like. Did you try and fight this conversation? No, not really. I I, I knew it was I, I knew it was coming because I felt I almost felt myself had been like it previous weeks, right. and in my head I'm like, oh, you know. I'll, I'll be okay. I was kind of just batting it off a little bit, but I kind of knew it was in there. And then obviously I had the call with Billy, you know, and then I was like, okay. And then after that, I was, I was great. Like, I, you know, I've I really made a, a concerted effort on, on the golf course to just be a little bit calmer, a little bit less, you know, less getting worked, getting less worked up about it. Um, and, and I just felt like it really, it really, really paid off. Um, and just, Obviously, I think it was like probably th- four or five tournaments later I won the US Open. I think it was four tournaments later. So, yeah. so that reminds me of a conversation we had with the British tennis player, Johanna Conta. And she spoke about the import of a psychologist called Juan Cotto, who saw that she, her attitude was probably what Billy was referring to. Yeah. And he gave her a really simple formula where he said, uh, struggle times resistance equals pain. So he said, so when things are not going well, when you fight it and say it's not fair and mm. that's not good enough, that increases the pain that you yeah, feel. Yeah. Whereas if you reduce the uh, the struggle, struggle yeah. you reduce the pain yeah. and you can actually exp- enjoy the experience. And one of the comments that I heard somebody make about you early on in your career is you need to get better at moving on from a bad shot. A mistake, so you need to almost yeah, reduce yeah. the struggle that you go through. So, what lessons and techniques could you share with us about how you've learned to move on from a mistake or a cock up? Yeah, I think that's the thing. I, I wouldn't say I've fully learned my lesson. Um, <laughs> I would say that uh, you know, me and Mike talk about this a lot. I, I work with a psychologist, and um, it's kind of mainly based on on uh, chimp paradox, basically, and. Um, Mike would class me as like a C minus student, like, which uh, always makes me laugh. But he's probably right. I, I probably don't necessarily work quite hard enough on on that side of it. Um, I think I have periods where I'm very good, and I have periods where I'm not so good. Um, I, I just find it hard to sit down and like actually do some sort of self thinking of about you know, how I would be better almost. And um, having worked with with the guy that, Robbie, that I work with, like, I definitely feel better after I talk to him more, like, regularly to be able to kind of just get things off my chest and um, talk about how, you know, how I'm feeling, how my game's playing. But at the same time, in my own mind, I, I often try and think, well, you know, what is the what's the plan what's the three month six month year plan um and at the end of the day like as much as i try to buy into this like it is only golf and um, i've already created a, a great life for myself and it's trying to look at that side of the perspective rather than just trying to beat myself up all the time so if we use the example of johanna she said that she came up with ideas of she'd write 
reminders on a tennis racket of just look up at the blue sky or yeah. smile a bit more. And it was simple things I to remember to... tell me smile. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> but for her, it, it was more about having that sense of perspective. Well, yeah, yeah. I don't tell people in the office to smile more. You know what I mean? Like the, the people who come to watch golf tournaments or they tweet at you or we were laughing about on the plane this morning, like some of the other uh, Ryder Cup lads, you know, it's like, oh, you should smile more. It's like, well, you know, we don't come into whatever industry you do and and do like, oh, you know, you look a bit miserable today. Like, smile more. It's that 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 is a bit annoying, but um, I, I get it. You know, I get it. It's you know, me hitting it in the rough or in the water is a just very tiny yeah. problem compared to. I think there's also a random thing if you're hitting it in the rough and then got a great big beaming smile on your yeah, face. Yeah, well, yeah, and that's then there's a whole other thing. issue. And that, I think that is my. I think my my big concern that I've I've spoke about before to the people around me is like I worry that if I have this come off now I all of a sudden have this persona of like ah, it's all right it's only, it's only golf people will be like oh, he doesn't care anymore like you know he's, he's, sure. he he doesn't care are you protecting yourself a bit then when you when you have these kinds of conversations where if you become easy and comfortable with the game of golf then you become easy and comfortable with losing yeah. And I wonder whether you just don't allow yourself to go there. Yeah, I like, yeah, I mean, I had a, a chance to win recently and I was absolutely gutted that I didn't win. Um, I just didn't want to talk for the, I, I finished, got back to the hotel room, just didn't say a word to my both now fiance, literally didn't say a word, like, and she's like, you know, it's fine. Like, you know, you, you played so well. It was close, just a couple bad hole, blah, blah. And she was fantastic about it. Like, she was so nice. And my parents came in because we were going for dinner. And they were, you know, it was so nice. But at the same time, in my mind, I'm just thinking, you, you don't get it. Like, I mm. wanted to win. Like, I really want, you know what I mean? It's and What is it that you really want? And is it that you want to be the best? Is it that you want the... I guess it's no longer about the check. You've had a lot of those in your career and that's fantastic. So is it the silverware? I, what's that thing? It's the beating everyone. You know, it, it is the, it's the winning. It, it is the winning. It's, you know, it's funny. Before I won the US Open, I remember specifically Brooks Kepka winning majors and seeing him kind of do stuff in the media and... um various other bits and pieces. And, and I thought to myself a little bit, I'll be honest, you know, I you know, wouldn't mind a little bit of that. That's quite cool and um, looks enjoyable. Then I won the US Open, did the Netflix, and I mean, things have changed like drastically, you know, go out to, to dinner. I'm like, I've never had this in my life. Go out to dinner, people come up, oh, can I have a picture? Can you sign this? And like, it's never a problem. I don't mind. Everyone's, I've been very lucky. Everyone's so polite to me and, and, and great, but you know, it's, it's bizarre for me. It's really is bizarre, you know, n never growing up with anything like that, never been in that sort of limelight. And now like you're halfway through your dinner and someone's coming over and it's just, it's really, really odd. Um, and I think it's been a little bit hard for my mum and dad because, you know, they've never experienced it too. And they're getting, things left, right and centre. But when we watched you on that Netflix documentary <laughs> after you'd won the Open, you almost looked a little bit underwhelmed and I was reminded of when we spoke to Sir Chris Hoy and he said that winning was everything when he won the gold medal and he forgot to, to celebrate yeah. afterwards because that wasn't what he was focused on. It was just the crossing that finish line first and that was the feelings that I got when I saw you walk into you group of family and friends you almost looks a little bit underwhelmed by the experience yeah i think you know i said I, well i wouldn't say i was underwhelmed i like you know i i was i'd argue it's the you know best day of my life you know in, in my opinion it's what i'd worked for what i grew up trying to do and you know i remember being on the green and saying to like my my dad like you know we we did it, you know, and it's like, it was just, yeah, it, it was just an unbelievable moment for me. Um, but like, at, at the same time, what comes after it is kind of all new and, t and it's, it's kind of sometimes hard to get your head around that it's like, 
this is the new norm and you you've got to you got to accept that you know it can't just be like oh you know go away leave me alone it's you can't just be a recluse you know what i mean one thing you mentioned earlier on in the interview was the sort of the mental struggle after winning that us open and how it was hard to sort of find the motivation again what did you learn in that period that would be valuable for our listeners i think the biggest thing was time um i think i was playing so well at that period of time and and it you know the time the game was like felt easy and i felt like i could just recreate that and then all of a sudden it was kind of like you have a period of where you're not playing so well and it's like well now what like all of a sudden the bug came back and it's like oh i want to i want to work hard and stuff like that and i think it is Sometimes it is you just got to give it some time to. Where did it go though? Like, have you worked? Have you worked out where that bug went when you were? I think it was. The US Open yeah, champion? I think you know. I think it was just that I wanted to enjoy what I'd achieved. I think for for a longer period of time than than I was probably allowed. Yeah. Um, because I I won. I had two weeks off, and then I was playing two tournaments then three weeks off, then three tournaments. And like the season's still going, you know, the season doesn't stop for you. It's like I still had to compete and yeah. there was still a lot to play for. But even though there's a lot to play for, it was like hard to, to get up for it almost because it was like, well, no, I've done what I needed. Yeah. I want to just chill. How, how old were you at the time? 27, 28? 27. So you're like, I've spent, I don't know, 23 years of my life trying to reach this moment. I've reached it. Oh, nothing's changed. I've, I've got to go and gotta, play the next time. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, 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 totally. Whereas I think a lot of people believe that that moment of achievement, suddenly the whole world makes sense yeah. and the heavens open and yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm eternally it happy. forever, yeah, yeah. And it doesn't. And it, Yeah, it, it, it doesn't. And that's why you, then you, you have that period and you're like, well, actually now I want it again. You know, I want that winning feeling again. And how different is that then? Because we mentioned at the start, you play a losing sport. You know, you've been on the US tour for a number of years and you've won you know, two major two major competitions. Like it could be two or three years till you get that feeling again. So what's the motivation? What keeps you coming back for more? To, to win every week. Yeah, uh, that's... And, and I, I enjoy the process of practicing and getting better. Um, <clears throat> I enjoy finding any way that I can get better, listening to podcasts, trying to, re you know, reading books, um, speaking to other people in the industry, outside the industry. Um, for me, it's like, it's enjoyable to, to try and get better. Um, and particularly at my age, I feel like I've got still plenty of years left of my best golf and, and that's where I want to, you know, I want to get to. I want to get to world number one and win more majors and I can't just sort of, coast for the next few years like I've, I feel like I've got to excel still so would you answer this question with total honesty right bearing in mind we've already established that you're one of the most humble guests we've <laughs> ever had on the podcast right if 100 is the very greatest you can ever be and zero is the day you were when you first picked up a golf club where are you uh, right now I feel like I'm probably 75 probably 80 i still feel like there's 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 plenty in the in the tank it's exciting yeah yeah it is um i want to have a really really big off season this this year um and like i feel this year has been a weird year for me i don't feel like it's been my best but i feel like i've made strides in certain areas um and i feel like if i can kind of match those strides those gains with where I was in like May, June, twenty two thousand twenty two, then, then that's like a you know that's almost the the finished finished product really. So, um, just gonna take time. But you also got a text message, didn't you, after winning the Open from probably one of the greatest sportsmen of yeah. all time? Yeah. Would you tell us who that was? But equally, yeah. Did you get the chance to follow up and ask them how they'd sustained success? Yeah, the the text was from Michael Jordan, um, which made me laugh because he actually texted me again after, uh, yeah, after I won earlier this year, and uh, 
it was a different number and I replied, oh, you know, thank you very much. Sorry, who's this? And he was like, oh, <laughs> Did you? yeah, yeah. He's like, oh, sorry, it's, it's MJ. I was like, oh my God, I feel so embarrassed, you know. Um, but I, I've not spent a lot of time with him, but I'm a member of his, of his club in Florida and um, the guy that coaches him a little bit, he's learned a lot off, off Michael and um, he shared some of that with me. I, I've not, like I say, I've not spent a lot of time with him, but his big thing was, you know, practicing with intensity. It's like every shot matters. Um, and that's one thing that we've tried to add in to practice away from tournaments. It's harder at tournaments because you've only really got the range and where I'm a member there's loads of different, you know, you can hit a shot here and then walk over there and, and hit a shot to a different green. And, and it just, you know, we can create the intensity by having it. If you don't complete it, start again. If you don't complete it, start again. And, and, and it's things like that that I think um, was so big for, for him. And I think that is a fantastic lesson in that, you know, every shot has an intention and it's intense and there's a, you know, there's a consequence for it. And I think, it's it's hard to have that in golf because it's easy to just drag another ball out and try again. But, you know, if you've only got five shots, right, you've got five shots, you need to hit, hit it here, the first one. If you don't, you, you're done, you know. And, yep. and it's having those things like a task that has a consequence. It just, I feel like you then have that intensity and that's more like on, on the golf course. The aim of the game that me and Steve talk about is always making practice way harder than than tournament play. So how do you do that then? I mean, there's a famous story of Tiger Woods, his dad shouting abuse at him at yeah, yeah, key I mean, moments. Yeah, for, yeah, that, how that, do you replicate that's a big it? Thing. I mean, um, <clears throat> I'm very fortunate. Again, the, the Grove facility is is second to none. There's there's all sorts of different things you can do. Um, but, you know, we might do a challenge of, right, okay, you've got to hit it within this zone. You've got to hit a shot within this zone. Then you go and walk 20 yards over there to the green and you've got a hole a putt from 10 feet. And then... You go back, you hit another one in the zone. Okay, how how many can you do in a row? Or what is, you know, what's the proximity of those shots? And, you know, you keep a record of that, right? Okay, this time can we beat that whilst doing it? Because like I keep saying, you know, you're just not hitting seven iron after seven iron after seven iron. Every single shot is different. And you need to have that, that pressure of... Cause it feels shit when you don't complete the challenge, and it's it. Uh, we do a great one with the with the driver um, that I don't want to give away, but uh, <laughs> it, it's something that I, I was really struggling. I didn't really look into it as much as I probably should have, but two three months ago I was struggling to complete it, and I knew I wasn't driving it very well, and 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 I did struggle to complete it. And then Steve came over to see me last week in, in New Jersey and I did it in three attempts. Like it was just bang, bang, bang. And we, I'd done it. And I was like, yeah, that's a really good sign, obviously, for me because I feel like that's a long way different from where I was two months ago. So one of our favorite questions we like asking guests is, if you were to divide up your golf game between physical, so like the technical mm -hmm. stuff that you've just described, and the mental side of it, what proportionality would you offer to each? Everyone's like, oh, golf's 99% mental. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, it, I, would, I would say like, I would probably say 75 physical. and No, 70 physical, 30 mental. Um, it doesn't matter how good you are mentally. If you, if you can't hit the ball straight, you know, it doesn't matter. But in those final moments coming down the last five, six holes when the pressure's on, you need to be strong mentally, not to kind of just wilt. And before we move to our quick five questions, I'd like to finish there about mental strength in the moment that matters because we've spoken for the last hour and a bit about preparation to play golf, right? There's one thing that you can't recreate anywhere and that is the pressure of winning a tournament with a shot, right? Mm -hmm. And I appreciate, again, you don't want to reveal everything, <laughs> but I would love it if you would share with us what you were going through mentally when you played those final few shots to win the US Open. Yeah, I think during that time, I think once I got to about 14, I was obviously knew I was back in it. 15 made a birdie. 
I was like, what was I? I was one clear with two to play. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, I was playing really, really well. Like I, I just, it was the best I've ever played. You know, there's no doubt about that. Like under the circumstances and um, I was just hitting exactly where I wanted. Everything about it was just like perfect, really. Um, but I didn't feel nervous. Like I felt more nervous two weeks ago in Switzerland than I did when I was at the US Open. And th there's no, there's absolutely no doubt about that. And I just don't know if, because in Switzerland, I was probably expected to win. Um, or some of these other tournaments I've played where I've been uncontested, I expected to do well. The US Open, I probably wasn't really expected to win. Um, I'd obviously played well and had success at that course before, but I still feel like that, you know, Wills Altoros, who's American, it's an American crowd. It's kind of like I was almost a bit the underdog and... Um, I was just so focused and committed on on how well I was playing. I just think it was kind. Of, it just felt as cliche as it is. Like I was just like in the zone. And and I think I look back to that a lot and compare it to some of my poorer rounds. And every single shot that we had, I go through the round. I've been through the round multiple, multiple times, and it's like every single one was like a hundred percent commitment. There was not. There was doubt on one shot. And that was the 10th hole and I hit a really poor shot. Outside of that, there was no doubt on any single shot I hit all day. And I think back to, it's very rare, I feel like, you get rounds that that happen like that because they would, you know, we'd have a yardage, oh, it's this club, it's perfect. And it's just like, bang. Um, I think that was the, the big difference that day. And coming down the final stretch, it was like, oh, I just go, bang. You know, this is, the bang. It was just very like, see it do it and did you allow your brain to go to the young matt being yes. driven course to course with his dad and yes yes a hundred percent yeah the the night before i remember speaking to mike and i was like i, I almost i was in contention at the uspga earlier in the year in may and i i remember just going to bed thinking oh you know i could win the uspga tomorrow like a major championship it was huge and i just didn't play very well and i was playing at 100 miles an hour and I look back I was playing too fast and all that and then I called Mike Saturday night before US Open final a final round and and uh, he was basically saying to me you know you just got to like, accept that you think you can win but that's great that's absolutely fantastic it was never like oh but what if I have a bad round and it was it was the other it was the other way around I was almost getting too like yeah, I can win you know I can totally win this you got to accept it but then you just got to go out there and just you know, play your game and see what happens. And, you know, that, that's what I felt like I did very, very well. When you visualize a shot, do you see it as almost like watching it on a screen so it's external to you or do you see it from your own perspective? No, I mean, I see it, I see it like... I just visualize the ball kind of going up as if it's like on a PlayStation game. Do you? you know, I just like with a trail behind, you know, like you see on the TV, that's how I see it going up and, yeah. So on that last shot, what was that like? Yeah, I mean, on, on the last shot, it was out of the bunker and, and I, I was terrible out of the fairway bunkers all year and that was the shot that I had and I hit this shot. And I'll just never forget because where we were aiming was like well away from where the ball actually ended up and I just I tried to hit the shot where I was, where I was aiming and I just remember looking up and it was like going towards the flag and I was just like, oh my God, this is like, thank God, like I've had such a good shot there. And I kind of played it so quick almost to be like, well, I'm ready, let's just, you know, just get on with it rather than kind of like, oh, well, but what if this and what if that? And again, it goes back to the commitment. It's like bang, bang, bang. And, and it was and it was obviously great. Obviously. <laughs> uh, we've reached the point of our quick fire questions, Matt. The first one is, what are the three non-negotiable behaviours that you and the people around you should buy into? Uh, work hard. Um, be humble, down to earth, and be honest. Yeah, I don't want anyone, you know, beating around the bush or um, just being a yes, yes person, really. What advice would you give to a teenage Matt? Just yeah, just work hard, work smart, 
Um, I think that work hard has always been a big thing for me. Like I've always wanted to make sure that I'm I'm working hard, but I think working smart is actually what I've learned more now. Um, don't necessarily need to hit 500 balls a day. It might be 200, but with much better intensity, you're probably going to get more out of it. So uh, probably, be, yeah, work smart. Great. And that comes with experience and time, right? Exactly, yeah. Would you recommend a book or a podcast or something that you love listening to that helps you? Obviously, love listening to you you boys. The High Performance Podcast is great. Um, but um, for me, the, the Chimp Paradox by Steve Peters, that was, um, like I say, I'm C, C minus student according to my coach, but uh, I think it just is very good at simplifying how the, how the mind works. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received and why? I'd probably just say, you know, my, my parents just, you know, telling me to, to work hard when I was younger. Um, never been pushy about it. Just like, you know, if, if you do want to get anywhere, like you, you've, you've got to work for it. You can't just turn up and, and hope for the best. I would probably say that. But if you could go back to one moment in your life, what would be the moment and why? Right after I've hit the shot on 18 at the US Open. Yeah, I, I'd love to, to relive that, uh, that whole day again. Yeah, that would uh, be very, very special. What's your biggest strength and your greatest weakness? Biggest strength, I think, is always trying to pursue greatness and trying to get better. Um, just every day I'm probably thinking about something to, to try and help me. How can I recover better, play better, think better, and anything really. I think that's like my biggest strength is like my drive. I think my biggest weakness is, is probably... Sometimes I get in, I get in my own way, um, particularly on the golf course from from maybe a mental side. Um, you know, getting too worked up about I'm not playing well. Um, even even off the golf course, you know, if I've not had a good week or whatever, or I've not practiced well. Um, yeah, I think sometimes I can get in my own way. And finally, your one golden rule for people that have listened to this podcast um, about living a high performance life. I would say my one golden rule would be, well, yeah, I've said it a lot already, but it, it would be working hard and, or working smart. I just think, um, you know, if you don't push yourself to, to try and get better, you know, I don't think you, you're ever going to get to to where you want. So um, I would have to say that. Brilliant. And actually, I'm pleased you said that because I was thinking as you were umming and ahhing, I was like, if he says anything other than work yeah, hard, I know, yeah. it's not an authentic <laughs> exactly. answer. And I think that authenticity is is absolutely what I would say that interview was. Um, you know, you obviously work hard, you obviously care deeply, but also you're obviously on a journey. Like if we were talking to you in 2014, I think it would have been a very different conversation to 2023. And I probably think it might be a different conversation to in 2029. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, mate. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks guys. Privilege.